And what really made me recognize that our expectation of a thing is the failure of a thing because to define a thing is to limit a thing. It's, it's almost like the idea of the moment that you describe what God is, is the moment that you fail to describe God. Yo, what's good, everybody? It's Los here. We back on the throne of positivity where the first is last and the last is first. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and also the notification bell so you don't miss out on any upcoming videos. Thank you to all of our supporters of the ministry who have been helping and sowing seed into the ministry, blessing us. It has been amazing. And we're going to talk about some things that have been happening in the ministry that it's just like, wow, God is truly good. So thank you again. Okay, so last video we were talking about how things are never what you expect. And I got really vulnerable as usual. Uh, today, I want to get into things to show how things are never what they expect. And you would almost be led to believe that since they're not going to be what you expected, that they're going to be a little bit lower. And the initial experience of that is true. But I just want to tell you and show you in a real way that it's going to be better than you expect. And that's not just a cliche. That's not just a bumper sticker of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. It's a reality that God works all things through us for good of the world. So if you can be patient enough with the Lord, you're going to see how these things play out. So I want to talk about several things that have happened to me. And you can even see these things if you just look over the last few videos that I have posted. The last about three, four years of my life are basically documented. So if you look at my last season, the last couple of months from like October or September forward, you can see the progression that God has that God has made in my life. And I don't know how many of you remember, I think it was like October, the beginning of October, where I began to start having these episodes of mental breakdowns. And I talked about it with you guys. And I was very honest about that. That had to do with several things. I really felt like I was having an existential crisis. And the reason why that was is like, I felt like nothing was happening in my life. It felt like, all right, God, we're here. But then I have a shell of what you have promised me. I don't have the real thing. My wife is not here. You know, like I'm lonely. I don't have family, my friends. Like I was having a really hard time. But underneath all of that, I constantly kept in mind, he who promised is faithful. And I'm going to talk about something separate, but I'm going to make the connection of how God actually makes things better. As a youth, I had extreme social anxiety. Like it was chronic social anxiety so bad was my social anxiety that i could not interact with anybody and that comes from several things the divorce of my parents feeling confused not having direction in my life not having any male figure to really pour into me in a way that would help me get out of that I just completely and utterly shut down. And the only times that I did know how to interact was like with anger or lashing out. I was like a firecracker. That was my experience, right? I'm about to be 31 on Tuesday. I can't even believe that. I really feel like, uh, side note, I feel like anything prior to the age of 30 doesn't exist. Not that it's like, oh, well, look at that cornball. You know, I don't want to admit that that's who I was. No. In the sense that the last 30 years leading up to this point of the age of 30, it feels like I was trying to figure out who I was. And at age 30 feels like year one or year zero. So I'm turning 31, but in reality, I feel like I'm turning one because I finally feel comfortable in my own skin. And kind of getting back to what I was trying to mention to you is that I dealt with extreme social anxiety. I had many bouts of depression and I had to figure out my emotions. Eventually, you get tired of being tired with your own self. You get tired of your lack of ability to interact or communicate or whatever is the situation for you. But that was just what it was for me. And then you finally like confront these things. 
but these things didn't happen until I became Christian because now all the dirty laundry, I guess, the flaws in my character and what needed to be improved, I had a method to do that and I had God to reveal those things to me. So one of the greatest things that God has ever taught me, I learned this about, I would say, maybe like six, seven years ago. And that's in theory, I learned it. But again, it hasn't been until like now that I've actually learned how to implement these things in my life. And even still, it doesn't mean that I have any real grasp on it. But the concept is simply this. And it has to do with dealing with your emotions. We are very emotional creatures. So if we allow our feelings to dictate our mood, dictate our reality, we are going to be like deers in the headlights. We're going to be those. They they are creatures that are anxious about everything. Any any movement in the forest, any sound that is un, unfamiliar, any smell that they don't recognize or they do recognize, they're like, they're always on edge, ready to just dart at any moment. And that's how we are as Christians, as humans. If we don't get a hold on our emotions and recognize that our emotions are indicators, they're not meant to be the foundation of our life. And too often we make our life about our emotions and it's is not something that we should do. Is it's not a reliable source of direction in life, because emotions represent beauty. It has a lot of colorful things in regard to it. But if you're living your life based on your emotions, you're gonna be down one moment and then up the next. It's like living on motivation instead of inspiration. If you are motivated to do something, what do you do when there's no motivation? Motivation is like the fire that burns out quickly. It's like a match, a single match is going to burn out eventually, right? But inspiration is something that is a fire more consistent. The same is true about our emotions. If we think about our emotions like this roller coaster, you'll recognize how volatile it is and how inconsistent it is and how unreliable they are. So what I've learned from God is that if you can think about yourself being at a train station, if you wait for the right train and let the trains that don't pertain to you pass, if you get on the right train, it'll lead you to the place that God intends for you to go. The foundation or the station by which you're waiting upon is faith. But the trains that come in succession, you have to see what is this train and you have to determine it. OK, this is the train of anger. I don't want to get on that train. This is the train of sadness. This is the train of happiness. This is the train of bitterness. You got to analyze what is this train and do I want to go where it's taking me? Sometimes you just have to take the train for the ride because in and of itself, anger is not a sin. The, that's why the Bible says, do not sin in your anger. So you could take the scenic route of anger and recognize why you're angry and then get off at the next station. Or you could get on the train of sadness and recognize that that's the season that God has for you. So if you can see emotions like that and you wait for the appropriate moment or time or season that you are in and determine with God which train to get on and recognize this is more about the journey than it is the destination then you will know life is actually more beautiful if we can come to appreciate it in that way. That's my key that I've used to deal with my emotions is to recognize that emotions are indicators. They're not foundational. They help me to make sense of the world. Emotions are the flavor. They're the color to the world, all the range of emotions. But emotion isn't life itself. Faith and hope is life itself. But more specifically, faith in Christ and hope in God is life itself. So what does this have to do with my present situation and the transition between what has happened in October till now? We are in February, man. And I had to take a step back like recently because God has been doing so many things in my life that I didn't know I needed, even though I was asking for it. I know that sounds so dumb, but how contradicting are we as human beings? Or maybe it's just myself. This is why I don't rely on my emotions or I don't rely on myself. I rely on faith in God. Because 
in October, November, when I was having those existential crises, being by myself, it seems like that was such a time of darkness for me. You know, I was in the house alone and I was literally crying and weeping and breaking down. But it was in the utter destruction of self that God reformulated or rebirthed me as a man. But the way that he did that was through patience. I had the expectation of something, but God had the reality of something else. I wanted to be married. Like, Lord, all right, we got the house. Let's get this moving. Let's go. And I feel like as human beings, and again, I don't want to generalize, so I'm just going to speak for myself. I wanted to go from where I was and just like kind of jump over everything and get to like, all right, well, let's get married now. You know what I'm saying? But what about all the in between? Life is not a rush. We don't have to rush for the sake of whatever is ailing our hearts and souls. And, you know, another thing that was bothering me was being alone all the time. And although I was saying like I'm alone and I want something in my mind, what I'm saying or what I desired was my wife. But what God recognizes, is I'm not going to deal with his symptoms. I'm going to deal with the root of the issue. He thinks that what he needs in this moment is a wife. But in reality, he needs to get deeper in his relationship with me. He needs to go to the deepest depths of the abyss of his soul and situation so that he can recognize it's not a wife that rescues you. It's not your mother, your sisters, your brothers that rescue you. It's nothing materialistic that rescues you. It's only God in the dead of night who hears those cries. When everybody else is asleep, who's awake? God doesn't sleep, nor does he slumber. So, you know, obviously I knew these things, but it's, again, I always tell you guys, it's one thing to know something and another thing to know something. So he was proving himself to me when he had nothing to prove. And what God started doing is all of a sudden, my old friends started contacting me again. Like, yo, let's chill. I want to come over. And I'll be like, yeah, okay. You know, and at first I'm so like, solo i'm so alone right like how was i asking god i don't want to be alone and then when people want to chill it's just like man i'm too introverted you know as an introvert you make plans and then when it comes out to it, it's like golly i wish i never made those plans because i just want to be home right now but the reality is is you got to step out of your comfort zone and god recognizes what you need in the time that you need it because you think you need this over here and although that may be true that you need this or desire it so, he knows how to get you there. We just want to skip over it. We want to get to the end of the story. But God was doing things like that where it's like, okay, I'm developing his ministry. I'm reconnecting him with old friends. I'm building up his network. I'm building up his character. And I'm reconnecting with people. I don't feel so isolated anymore. The ministry was improving little by little. I started getting more and more comfortable in myself and the direction I wanted to take the ministry life is about change so things are constantly changing so october november passes december passes and then i feel like the greatest growth that i experienced was leaving social media december 14th when i finally let go of social media from that point forward god started to show me some of the most incredible things about myself and my promise and the agreement like the beauty and the power of coming into agreement that that was just beautiful and you know that we did the 21 days it was specifically there and after that it was like god started to bring real revelation in my life where he did amazing things that again i didn't know that's what i needed and what really made me recognize that our expectation of a thing is the failure of a thing because to define a thing is to limit a thing it's, it's almost like the idea of the moment that you describe what God is, is the moment that you fail to describe God. The moment that you use the word is in relation to God is the moment you fail to describe anything about God. If you say God is love, you fail to describe God because God is is and is not love in the sense that the word love is not all encompassing and if god could be described as god is love it's the failure of describing who god is because if god could be described by a single word then he's not god 
And this is like the, that's linguistics. I'm not going to get into that. But I'm trying to show you that we think that we know what we want. But the reality is by the very determination that we think that we know we want that is a failure to recognize reality. And if we just, yeah, we can have our expectations, we can have our ideas of a thing, but if we just relinquish control and surrender everything into his hands, which that's what I did, and that's where everything changed for me, and I saw the beauty of God reconfirming his promises and reassuring me through the foundation that is the rock, showing me the rainbow over and over again, reminding me of his promises. It's just beautiful, right? So like in the relinquishing of control and our expectations still having them, you allow God to work in the details. I had the expectation that God is just going to do it, but the reality is, is that expectation is false. God is not just going to do it. God is not a genie in the sky that just snaps his fingers. He works intricately in the woven details of the tapestry of life, this journey of life, this journey of faith is far more complex and complicated than we would like to admit. And if we just have this idea that God is just there to say yes and amen to us, he's not God to us. He's like our divine executive assistant. So if we allow God to work out the details, he's going to do it greater than what you expected. Now, I want to explain what led me to all of this so that you can see, just let God work this out. After I finished the 21 day fast, I was confused because it was like, wow, I experienced all this beauty. I was sacrificing and seeking God in the way that I was in a level deeper than I usually do. That's not really sustainable. But once you come to the end of a thing, we really don't like transition, man. There's this thing called liminal space. It's the in-between. It's like a gateway. So I'm neither here nor there. So if you can imagine this, this gateway, if you can think of this as a doorway or a gateway, it literally is a gateway because my bedroom is back there. <laughs> but if I was to stand right underneath that pillar, that would be liminal space because it's the in-between the den and then my the privacy of my master bedroom. So we don't like those in-between spaces because they're undefined. They're neither here nor there. But if we can allow God to work in that space, we do come out on the other side. He will either bring us backwards or forwards. But that's where I found myself at the end of the fast is like, I don't know what's next. It felt liminal. And it was, I'm even shaking now because the way that I felt back then was so uncertain. I wasn't sure what was to come next. Obviously, I had expectations that I wanted to be completed, but I was just like, Lord, I'm going to let you do what you want to do. And I, I even extended my fast five days after that, four or five days. And God gave me such revelation. He's like, it's time to go back to school, double down on the ministry continue moving forward and what you have done and I'll take care of the rest. And in so doing, by going back to college, I recognize that leaving the house and going and interacting with the world. I know that sounds weird, but I've been stuck in my condo forever. By interacting with the world, it made me look back at the times in the condo and it was like, wow, I see why you allowed me to go through everything. Now I appreciate what I have because I'm seeing all these things. I'm like, whoa, am I blessed? I don't think that I've been complaining up to this point, but wow. And leaving the house really made me recognize that God moves in ways we don't expect. And if we think that we can expect it, he's going to move the opposite direction. It doesn't make sense. If you can think about our expectation and our consciousness and our ability to perceive the way that God works or even the world as light. If you can imagine that if I have a flashlight here, it's going to shine like this in a cone shape, but it can't shine behind me. So God knows that field of view, the reach of our light. So he knows what we're going to expect. So by the very nature of God, knowing what we are expecting he can just operate wherever our expectation is not it's so simple of a thing for the lord to do that 
So we just need to let go of those things so he can operate. But what led me to really reflect on all these things is that my family's coming over here on my birthday, the 13th on Tuesday. Today's Friday, February 9th. It's 1042. They're coming here. My mom, my grandmother, and my uncle. Well, that's what I initially thought, right? And when they told me that, it made me so happy because I'm like, man, you know, I would have probably tried to make an excuse for them not to come because I don't want them to spend money like that. And, you know, it's a hassle for my grandmother. She's she's older, obviously, right? Five hours on a plane from Florida. That's crazy. But it made me happy. It, re it made me rejoice and it made me recognize. I didn't even know, like, maybe I've been thinking about things too, like, in the wrong way. Like, I had the wrong expectation of stuff. It's like they want to come and they want to love on me, you know, and I can love on them. And we exchange our love. And I was worried about finances and the wrong things. And it's just like, yo... Love is beyond what you're trying to make it seem. So just let them come. And I didn't even know that I, I needed that. But God is the one that's been orchestrating these things. And then later on, on my, my nephew's birthday on the 3rd of February, <laughs> my he turned nine years old. And they sent a video of him opening a plane ticket coming to San Diego. But they didn't mean to send me that video. It was supposed to be a surprise. So it was like after they, my mom told me that she was coming back in January. Then it's my nephew's birthday. And she sent the video to the wrong chat. And it got to me. And I'm like, wait, hold up. What y'all talking about? He's coming. Then they try to lie. Like, oh, it was just a joke. And I'm like, why would y'all joke with him like that? Don't do that to him. They were lying because they ruined the surprise, right? And then t that was the third. And then today's the ninth. I just hit up my sister, who's his mom. She has three kids, two boys and my niece. She's about to be 12 this year, which is crazy. Nine years old is my other nephew, February 3rd. And then February 13th is my birthday. Then February 15th is my youngest nephew's birthday. And I think he's turning three. I don't even know, man. <laughs> I don't even know. But I hit her up, the mother of the kids. And I'm like, yo, what's up, sis? Like, how you doing? Whatever. Just trying to have conversation and check up on my sister. And she's like, oh, I'm good. The kids are so excited to go over there. And I'm like, what you talking about the kids? What well, you talk about the kids, because from what I know, only Jace is coming, which is my nine-year-old nephew. What do you mean the kids are coming? She's like, oh, I thought mommy told you and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yo, y'all do not know how to keep secrets, bro. Like, And it's just crazy because if you can see the progression in January, my mom told me she's coming, right? And then that's my expectation is like my mom, my grandmother, and my uncle are coming. And then on the third I find out my nephew's coming. But then today I found find out my niece is coming, which makes more sense because when they asked my nephew, we're going to San Diego. They were like, who lives there? He's like, I don't know. Where's San Diego? I don't know. And he had no connection to me at all. And then like my niece, she's the one that's been wanting, she's been dying to come visit me and visit California. And it always made more sense for her to come. And when they told me he was the only one coming, I was like, man, that sucks because she's the one that really has been wanting to come over here. And then my sister tells me she's coming. Next thing you know, my my, my little, little nephew's coming, which I don't think so because he's a, listen, he's in his terrible twos. He's a little monster, a little minion, you heard? <laughs> but I love them so much. And I'm going to put a, a video or a picture of him and, and the kids so you could see them. And it's just like, if you could look at that whole scenario in regard to your situation and just apply that in life in general, it's like I never had the expectation of my mother coming for my birthday anyways. Then she's coming with my grandmother and my uncle. Then it progressed a week later and then my nephew's coming. Then my niece is coming. And it's like, you never know what to expect and God is working in ways you never know. So if you could just be patient and endure in the way that I was explaining earlier with emotions, Things are going to pass anyways. You might as well wait on the Lord. And if you could wait in patience and obedience, things are going to line up. And when they come to you, whether you feel prepared or not is irrelevant because if you're patient and obedient on the very basis of your blamelessness before God determines that you truly are prepared if not God won't bring it to you but if you're impatient and disobedient you have no guarantee of preparedness when these things come to you 
So this should give you eternal peace and recognize like, yo, I want to just be at peace with God. I want to be patient. I don't want to create my own expectations. Let God do what God does and let him surprise me as he wants to. I mean, the greatest surprise about all of this is I end up all, finding out all my siblings is coming now, too. You know what I mean? I don't think so, but that would be cute. That would be cool, you know? Kind of going back to what I originally mentioned of what was causing a lot of crisis with me, the expectation of having my wife. Like, as I see how God is developing things, it's been amazing. And seeing what God has done with the ministry, it was it, it, yesterday I couldn't even believe it. Because imagine I've just been doing the ministry and teaching and there's been like almost no engagement with the average of like 10 people watching at a time to all of a sudden 1.4K views on a single live. And then so many people were engaging with the teaching. That really did mean something to me because it goes back to the things that God has promised me. That he would use me for his glory if I would serve him. But I've gone through years and years of like plateau in a sense. We're seeing nothing and then all of a sudden it's a jump. Not that that's my expectation for what's to come in the future. But it's showing God is establishing me in the condo. He's establishing me in my emotions, my character, my identity and my mentality in my heart. It feels like everything is being placed in order and I'm. You know, where I wanted to skip all the way to having my wife and loving her in every single way possible, maybe it's okay to burn with passion. And I'm not making the direct correlation to what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but if we can talk as adults, obviously that's a thing, right? Like, I want to enjoy all the fruits of marriage. I want to enjoy every aspect of marriage, knowing and knowing in both senses of the word, but Maybe it's okay to burn in the sense that I'm not even talking about in the physical sense. Maybe it's okay to be denied because what I recognize is that the more that I'm denied my wife, the more that I want her. You know what I mean? The more God delays, the more I want what God wants for me. And I've talked about this a long time ago. I don't know if you guys remember this, but where there's increased hunger, there's increased appetite. So the more that God denies me the more that I want what his promise is. That's why I just leave it in God's hands. I don't want to apply my expectation on God and not even on my wife. I do have an expectation, but not that she has to live up to it, but it's just natural by the human condition. And what it's causing me to do is just like, yo, I'm going to just be patient and I'm just going to continue to believe as if things are. And when it finally comes and it finally happens in the way that God determines it, then I'll know that I'm prepared. But until that time, I'm going to take every opportunity to speak to things as though they were. I mentioned this in the video that if God can call things forth that do not exist, what's the issue with me talking to those things as if they do? That's why when I'm having these conversations talking to my wife, although she's the woman of my dreams and of my imagination, far beyond what I can imagine, I talk to her as if she's right before me, as if I could see her smile, as if I can look into her eyes and, you know, and I mentioned before too, like, you know, I, as soon as I know it's her, I'm going to marry her. Like we're going to meet at the altar. There ain't no dating, no none of that. But in reality, aren't we dating right now? Because the way that I walk around in this world is like, I'm loyal to God and I'm faithful to him. And because of that, I'm also faithful to her and loyal to her. And I, I believe that the same is true of her because I know that God is her everything. So if I'm walking around as if married already, right, then I feel like we're dating even though we're not talking because in some way our hearts are connected through God, which is our source and intermediary. So, yeah, I, I don't believe in dating, but in, in reality, we are now. We're getting to know each other now without anything in between. I know this sounds crazy, but... The reason why I do this is because I want to show hope for you as an individual, whether you're a man or a woman. To the man, I want you to know that, bro, you, you got to be a husband before you're ever a husband. You got to be a father before you're ever a father. And you have to be a man before you're ever a man. And you can do that by practicing it and walking it out now. You may not know who your wife is, but you could walk around like you know she's coming. Be careful with your eyes. Because this is something that I do. Like, 
you know, wherever I go, I don't want to be looking at women because what if I look at my wife and I see her looking at a man, how would I feel? That wouldn't make me feel good. I always keep her in my mind. Like I want to honor God and I want to honor my wife. So you could walk in that way. Be a husband before you're a husband. Respect yourself. Hold yourself to that standard because even in the church, women don't have expectation of us because we have not upheld the standards of God. So I want to encourage you, leave your expectations, but hold yourself up to a standard and far beyond what you expect. And then women, your husband is coming soon wherever he is. So be loyal to that man prior to anything ever happening. And and if faith is faith, then, then that's the thing that exists in the invisible. But we can walk in those things. I want this to be so real so that when it happens and God finally brings my wife and I together, when we tell the story of the impossibility of what God has done in our life and how we really met in his presence, according to his will, his word, his promise, and nothing nor no one could stop it. I don't know if anything will ever have been told in such a way. I want to live as a man unlike any before me. There's nothing new under the sun, but I want to try to do something new. I want to live as if I believe God exists. I want to live as if his promises are true. And if his promises are true, they're not just future, they're present. And I'm going to act like they are. So anyways, I hope I made my argument clear and coherent. And there was some type of cohesion in all the points that I have made. But have faith, beloved. God is working these things out. And it's going to be far greater than what you expected. But in the interim period... Is not just going to be greater. It's going to go from good to great to greater to greatest until finally he fulfills that promise to you. And now you receive it. And then now a new life is born. So anyways, continue to walk in faith and know and recognize God is going to do far exceedingly and abundantly greater than what you can imagine. So if you haven't subscribed, subscribe, comment, like. Y'all know what it is. It's your boy Los. We on the throne of positivity where nobody shall throne us. We out. Peace.